When my father was a baby, his parents put him in a boat on a journey towards the unknown. My father was born in the Palestinian city of Jaffa in 1948. And when he was four months old, we lost our homes. We lost our country and we became stateless refugees. 66 years later, 10 years ago, I found myself stranded in an airport because I had nowhere to go. I did not have the right to live, to exist anywhere on this planet because I was still a stateless Palestinian refugee. I had dared to join a massive movement known as the Arab Spring. We dreamed of freedom and equality and social justice. We had nothing other than the conviction of our beliefs. But the Arabs were ready for democracy, but the world was not. And I was punished with imprisonment and expulsion, ultimately arriving to Norway as a stateless refugee. Over the years, I built a reputation for myself as a voice for democracy, a voice against dictatorship. There are many who automatically connect my name to these themes. And it's true, I did that. I, I did that as an activist, I did that as an author, and, you know, you wear several hats in activism. But the hat that I'm most comfortable with is that of a strategist. You see, the, the job of a strategist is to live in the future. Strategists have to look at the big picture. They have to see everything as a trend, and they have to work at the root causes. So today I stand before you to speak not directly about dictatorship, but rather to warn against a deeper threat to democracy. You see, the most serious threat to democracy in the world is not autocracy, it's hypocrisy. And I'm going to try to tell you in, sh in three very short stories. The first story is about truth. And it's going to be the story of two truth tellers. One was a Saudi by the name of Jamal Khashoggi. I had the privilege of knowing and working with Jamal. Uh, I actually hosted him here in Oslo a few months before his murder. The second was a Palestinian by the name of Shireen Abu Aqle. Both were journalists. Both had the job of telling the truth. And both were killed for it. Both of their killers were Western allies. Jamal Khashoggi was killed inside his own country's embassy by an assassination squad. Shireen Abu Aqle was killed by an Israeli sniper who aimed his bullet to land between her press vest and her press helmet while she was doing her job. The leader of the world's most important, most powerful democratic nation, the United States, had the responsibility with, to deal with the situation. So what did he do? Instead of demanding accountability from his allies, he tried to get Shireen's killers to work with Jamal's killers, and he let both off the hook. Oil and apartheid were more valuable than democratic values. When democratic nations betray the truth-tellers, when democratic nations harbor this delusion that stability could come at the price of dead journalists, the cause of democracy retreats and the cause of autocracy advances. The second story is a little speculative, it's a little hypothetical, so I, I invite you to imagine, visualize with me. Imagine that we are to send, we're going to send the mission to Mars. And imagine two scenarios. In the first scenario, we're going to send 100 people and we'll give all of them the same education, the same training, the same know-how, and exactly the same resources. In the second scenario, we're going to do the same. We're going to send 100 people but this time, we're going to give only one of them all of the know-how, all of the knowledge, all of the skills, all of the training, and all of the resources. And let's say we leave them, and we come back to check on them a few years later to see which of these scenarios ended up as a dictatorship. The recipe for creating a dictatorship is to trust someone with too much power and then sit back 
and hope for the best. There can be no democracy without equality, and there can be no equality without democracy. When democratic nations send more and more power and wealth to less and less pe people, when democratic nations harbor and foster inequality, the cause of democracy retreats and the cause of autocracy advances. The third story is rather personal. You see, I'm, I'm the father of, of a nine-year-old child. My son is smart, he is happy, and like me, he's autistic. A few weeks ago, his mother and I attended a regular development meeting here in Oslo to catch up on his progress, and I sat around the table with 10 very highly qualified professionals who are discussing and obsessing about how to give this child the best chance in life. And I left the room with a sense of pride, but also a sense of sadness. You see, it takes so much effort to preserve our gains, our democratic gains, so that another generation can enjoy them, and that, so that they can pass it on to their children. But before that, it takes so much effort by so many to raise a child. Since October 7th, 13,000 children have been killed in Gaza. Nearly 30,000 have been maimed. 28,000 have lost one or both parents. 139 have been killed every day. And every single child in Gaza, over a million of them, have been traumatized for life. They will carry this trauma all their lives. They're going to pass it on to their children. 40 or 50 or 60 years from now, we're going to be dealing with the trauma that has been created under the watch of the world's most powerful democratic nations. When democratic nations treat some kids as sacred and other kids as collateral damage, when democratic nations defund humanitarian programs to score political points, when democratic nations betray children anywhere, the cause of autocracy advances and the cause of democracy retreats. So these were three stories, and I could have stood here and, and told you 10 or 20 or 30 stories. Democracy is a house held up by many values, many pillars. And when democratic nations betray their own values, they do far more damage to the cause of democracy globally than anything that autocrats can do. But just like there are several ways to betray a democracy, there are also several ways to stand up for it. One is to empower those who have been systematically disempowered. You see, there's a reason why human rights violations happen. It's not only that powerful people act badly, it's also that power, powerless people exist. Some people have been systematically disempowered, and so the powerful can do whatever they want to them. You'll notice that I've been introduced as the founder and head of Kawakibi Center, and I guess this is a good time to announce that um, I've have, I have actually stepped down from Kawakibi as president, and I've dedicated my full attention to a new initiative. PACT International is a fund, a community, and a movement. It's a project that aims to build power for, by, and on behalf of Palestinians across the world. It's a Palestinian institution and a Norwegian institution, and I hope they'll find strong support. Build power for those who have been systematically disempowered. So I began the speech with my background as a stateless refugee, and I feel like I, that story needs some closure. The truth is, I'm no longer a stateless refugee. Uh, last summer, I was granted uh, citizenship in Norway. So today, I stand before you not only as a Palestinian, but also as a Norwegian. I'll be honest, I struggled with it. I've been, I've been, a, I've been a stateless refugee all my life, and I felt like I was giving up an identity. I'll never forget how heavy my refugees' travel document felt when I was giving it up for the last time. 46 years of statelessness came to an end in a second. Four generations of statelessness. That night, I dreamed of my ancestors, and I dreamed of the millions, generations of them who will never get this far. And then I woke up, and I walked out. It was summer. I walked up to the terrace on top of my building, not very far from here, and it was a beautiful day, blue sky, bright sun, and I looked over Oslo in all directions, and a feeling of love overwhelmed me, a love for the hills, for the city, for everyone in it, 
And there, I was able to say to myself for the first time, this is my country. These are my people. And together, from this place of safety, we're going to do everything we can to heal our world. Thank you.